Welcome to Life Science Leaders, a series of webinars and podcasts for leaders within the life science industry. Throughout the series, I will be interviewing senior leaders across the sector, covering topics that are relevant to what is happening in the industry right now and how that is affecting businesses, the market and people. And today I'm speaking with Pierre Van Weberen, Managing Director of Grow Biotech. So welcome Pierre and thank you for taking the time out to be part of this podcast series today. No, no, thank you, Claire. Thank you for having me. Oh, you're welcome. So, Pierre, would you be kind enough to tell the audience a bit about yourself, who you are, and what you do, please? Yeah, I'll do a, I'll do a quick intro. So, I'm Dutch, um, uh, trained as a German teacher, um, then moved into pharmaceutical industry. I'm not going to... Uh, on that. Um, spent 35 years in pharmaceutical industry, initially in the Netherlands, uh, with a company called Wyeth. And then came to the UK for Wyeth early 2007 to run the immunology business. And uh, many of you people know that Pfizer then bought Wyeth. And in the usual Pfizer takeover way, management team left very quickly, went to MSD, took over the immunology team in MSD, then moved into primary care in MSD, which was very interesting because I started my career in the Netherlands in diabetes and then I was back in diabetes in, in MSD, moved uh, to Novo Nordisk in the UK to run the diabetes team, and then um, kind of a little bit by accident, but also because I, I, was, I was thinking about it anyway, t- uh, moved to a company called Ashfield Healthcare. And Ashfield are the biggest outsourcing company, I think, in the UK. So anything around what you want in a field team or in a remote team, we would we would source to you. And what you get with that, there's a lot of flexibility and agility and everything and all these things. And that's what I was looking for in pharmaceutical industry anyway. Uh, how can we do quick, how can we do quick things quicker? How can you be more agile? How can you be more on the ball? And, and sometimes that just becomes a bit difficult if you're in big pharma. So uh, Ren Ashfield in the UK, um, and then, uh, purely by coincidence, landed with Girl Biotech because I, I was approached by a headhunter, recruiter, uh, and they were looking, Girl Biotech was looking for somebody to kind of pharmaceuticalize the business. It's a bit of a silly word, but cannabis, the cannabis industry is an industry where a lot of people uh, threw a lot of money at it because at some point in time they thought, oh, I missed the Amazon.com boom. I missed the Airbnb. I missed Uber. I'm not going to miss this cannabis thing. <laughs> uh, so so yeah, lots of people with lots of money, but very little understanding of pharmaceutical yeah. industry and the healthcare market. So they, they set up structures, they set up organizations, but had no idea about how to talk to doctors, had no idea about compliance, had no idea about... Uh, how you promote, or, or in this case, actually cannot promote because it's unlicensed medicine. So they they set that all up, but were quite in need of somebody who could do that. And yeah, I, I happened to be in the right place at the right time. So that's what I started doing last year. So that's me. And in my spare time, I do a bit of uh, golf, uh, painting, and time with my family. Um, perfect. Thank you so much for that, Pierre. You're welcome. I need to tell the audience, obviously, what we're discussing today in terms of this uh, podcast. So, the topic we will be discussing is life in a startup organisation. Now, I know that that's going to be an interesting topic, Pierre, uh, because many of our listeners will be interested, as a lot of our clients are in fact startup companies at varying stages. Mm-hmm. So. To make our audience well, I mean, obviously, you've just touched on that. You personally have come from working in large corporate organisations in the pharma world to now working for a smaller startup and have experienced, I guess, both sides of the fence, so to speak. So let me start by asking you how you personally found the transition from the corporate world to joining a startup and the main differences, I guess, in, in both environments. Yeah, it's it's an inter- it's, a, it's a very good question, actually. The, the, you know, when you when you big pharma um, is, and, I, and I've worked in big pharma, the bigger companies get, the slower companies generally get, the, the slower decision-making becomes. 
um, the more people get involved, the higher the risk. Because I, I mean, if you if you you have a product that is one million and one percent of the total per normal of the company, if that goes wrong, that's much less of an issue. If you have a product than if you have a product that is fifty million turnover or hundred million turnover. So with increased revenue comes increased risk, becomes increased cautiousness. And um, when I moved to Ashfield, one of the things that I remember saying in my kind of introducing myself uh, uh, talk to the to the team was that I hoped that they that the pace was high, and I wasn't disappointed. Yes. Uh, and and that's probably much more of a service industry um, uh, thing than anything else. But that was a big change. And then moving from service industry into back into small pharma startup, you combine both pace and uh, quick decision making, uh, uh, having to worry about, or not worry, having to look at, at revenue streams, having to look at cash flow, which is something that even in a business unit director role or in a managing director role in a pharma company, you don't really look at. But now I suddenly find myself looking at uh, our creditors and see where they are, where they are, where they are with paying their bills. So it's it's yes, it's smaller, but I've always been very quite hands on in what I did anyway. So that didn't really change. I'm very close to the team. Um, I I want to go and know our customers. So that didn't really change. But it's the pace of the decision making, the agility around it, the the being on the ball on where you are with your finances and um, and the pace, those are, the, I think, the big, the big differences. And I love it. I enjoy it. It's, 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 it's so much more fun uh, to, because it, it also feels like your, it also feels like your responsibility is closer, or, or more tangible. I can imagine. I like that. Definitely. I guess you know. I come from big corporates myself, and I know you know that you have to go around the world and back sometimes, you know, just to get anything approved and sign off. So processes can be quite tenuous, definitely in, in, uh, in the corporate side of things. And like you say, in a smaller organization, you're, you're more, I guess, you know, on the front line, so to speak, and you have to always sleep up and, and just get involved really. So. Yeah. yeah. And it's, it's, one, it's trust, isn't it? One of these things, you know, cause we're all doing five different things. So there's a job description, but that doesn't resemble anywhere near what we're actually doing. Um, and you, you need to trust people that they, they, they do what they're supposed to do, but that they're also confident enough to know that when they have to come and ask and, and don't go and do nothing or don't sit on it and wait for somebody else to do it. That, that bit, I love it. Yeah, good. So, <clears throat> excuse me, I guess when any new company is setting up, you know, there's always a lot to do and to think about, but, what would you say are the key factors in your experience? Uh, you say the key factors and priorities founders of startups should really think about when they're establishing a business. Yeah, I th- you know, all these things start with a really good idea, mm-hmm. and then and then you're successful, and at some point in time you run into bumps. Your yep. say don't work the way they work, um, but as long as you're on the up, you you kind of have you, there is this risk. Of, of, of losing sight of the customer because your success justifies that you're doing the right thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, how do you define success? Whether you achieve your targets or you achieve a sale, but you, you're kind of, oh, we grew another 20% or we grew another 30%. Maybe you could have grown 50 or maybe you could have grown 100, but you're, you're, you're doing, you get into this do, 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 uh, act, 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 and, and every now and then, you just need to stop and, and, and reflect and look and get the team together and, and be careful that it's not just you because it's easy in small companies. Yeah. The, C, the CEO says we go left and we all go left. Nobody questions it. Nobody challenges it. Uh, and, and that's where you see many of these startup companies at some point in time they fail because they become bigger and bigger and bigger. And until it was 10 people or 15 people or 20 people, the CEO or the owner or the founder could just tell everybody where to go and had control. Right. And then it's 50 people and you start losing control, but they never learned how to deal with that. They never learned how to delegate, all of these things. So 
yeah, reflect, look at your strategy. Are you still on there? Are you not spreading yourself too thin, which is very easily done? Are you not running or chasing after things that um, actually cost a lot of time and energy but may not deliver as much as on? Make choices um, and trust your team and, and use your team yes. to, to, to look at where you are. Because very often there are a, a, a lot of smart people in your team but we forget to utilize them. Yeah. Uh, so there's things like that. It's, it's, it's not rocket science. It's, you get this thing about, um, we, did this, we did this little experiment once about um, little teams that had to compete with people, with, with each other, and, you got, and they got this task about finding stuff all the, all the way somewhere in the hotel, in the hotel uh, building. And everybody started running around. And then halfway through it, they, they paused us all. And they said, do you actually have a plan? Or are you just running around? Yeah. And that's, and that's what football teams do, isn't it? You, you start with a plan, but changing it halfway through the game doesn't really work. You see these, these managers shouting on the side, oh, well, go left, go left, and everybody just keeps on going. And then they come out of the dressing room after the teammate, and then they do things differently. Because you have this 15-minute break. Yeah. We had the chance to talk about it and reflect on it. And then you can pause and restart. So stuff like that. Stuff yeah, like which that. makes absolute sense. I think, you know, sometimes you're right. You get so caught up, <coughs> excuse me, in, in what the original plan was that, you know, sometimes you just don't take that step back to, to reassess. And yep. be, are we actually still on track to, to where we yep. were? You know, yep. trying to be. So you raise a really good point there. And, and I guess, you know, life is always full of challenges. But what would you say... Um, that you see as some of the main challenges that startup organizations do come up against. And I guess, has that changed potentially? <clears throat> Excuse me, frogging my throat today. Has that changed potentially over the last few months with, with COVID-19? Yeah, I mean, the, what, the interesting thing with COVID is that it, it forced companies, it forced a lot of people, GP practices, hospitals, everything else. It forced a lot of uh, change that people may have been thinking of or about, but never really got to implement and never really thought about doing. And, and now uh, they had to, and guess what? It worked. So you're, you, <laughs> you, you get this, um, what, why did we not do that before? So you kind of um, resistance, I don't know, what is it? Resistance to change. The, a, a, lot of, a lot of companies, and, I've, and I've, I've said that about some of the companies that I worked for, do not change unless they have to. Mm -hmm. and, and the ones that are successful are the ones that change because they want to. And that's a, that's a massive difference. Yes. Uh, because you're, that's the difference between re being reactive and being ahead of things. Mm -hmm. and, and the companies, the companies that change because they, they thought about their strategy, they thought about the execution, they thought about whether the issues are still the issues that, they, that, that existed when they started. And if, you, and if you make changes gradually, three, four, five months or sometimes years in advance of what you actually think is going to be the future, then the gradual change is a lot less difficult for the organization to make. Yeah. Absolutely. And if you, have to, if you have to do this knee-jerk, five minutes to 12, if you don't do it now, it's all going to go sideways. That's where, that's where organizations lose faith in, in, in management and where the disconnect between management and the rest comes. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, look ahead. Look at, don't, don't live in the now, but live in the what do you want the future to be world and what are you going to do to make that future? I think that's something... That, that I believe is probably one of the most important things. We, we could have all seen this coming. I mean, maybe not the reason for it, but when I was in Ashfield, we had these discussions about what, what can we do to um, train reps that are more suitable or would be better or, or would, some, would deliver something different mm -hmm. versus traditional uh, pharmaceutical reps. And you kind of, you kind of keep thinking in the incremental change. And then somebody said, what if five years from now, 
there will not be any sales reps anymore. Oh, interesting. What are we going to do then? And everybody in the room like, well, uh, <laughs> that's a problem. <laughs> yeah. Obviously, that's an issue. But it's not that, it's not that unrealistic. Agreed. Yeah. And, and look at it now. We suddenly have COVID. Everybody is ho at home. You're not going to do the usual face-to-face -face doctor interaction mm -hmm. anymore. A lot of it has to happen. But in, in the three, four, five months that nothing happened, did things really change? Yeah. What, what was the impact of that? So I think what you will see is that a lot of companies suddenly now realize that they, that they A, changed, but B, that what they were doing actually didn't make such a big difference or with the difference that they thought they would make. So you get a bit of a difference in addressing, so how, how do we look at the future? Are we going to look at the future differently? Are we, ask, are we going to ask different questions? I think that's, that's what I think is the big change that has happened. Apart from, like, yes, we can do things digitally, and yes, our GPs suddenly are a lot less busy because everything can be done virtually or something. Like that. Those, are, those are things that would have happened anyway, 10, 15, 20 years in the future. Do you think that that would have happened inevitably anyway? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It just now got accelerated, but it also, I think, made a lot of people think. You know, this discussion about uh, why did all these companies have all these difficult rules about working from home? I remember, I mean, 10 years ago, you had to fill out a form <laughs> if you wanted to work from home, <laughs> and, and your manager had to sign off on it, and you had yeah. to tell them what you were going to do. I mean, I, 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 I never filled out one of those forms, ever, nor did I and I refuse to sign one of them off because it, it has nothing to do with trust. But fundamentally, a lot of companies never really trusted their people yeah, to work from home and not be watering the plants or watching TV or playing mm -hmm. with the kids. And now suddenly, oh, actually, people do work from home. So there's a, there's a, difference, in, there's a difference in the trust base, I think, between employers and employees as a result of that. So those are, for me, are fundamental changes that happen yeah. because of it. Really. And that's just good. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. Change is good. And, and you, do, you always get those, those two schools of thoughts, really. The, the people that really embrace change and you know, run with it and welcome it, and then obviously the resistance side to it. But, but so much has changed, as you've been saying over the last few months, that it's just going to be part of our lives now, isn't it? And so, you know, I think people that are resistant now need to start embracing it a little bit more. And, and like you say, companies have had to change with their working style, but of course the productivity has still been there. So. Yeah. It's difficult, isn't it? I mean, you can do, I did philosophy. Part of the things that I did at university was philosophy, but you can, you can understand why our, our primitive brain not regulated by the neocortex is resistant to change. Of course we can. That's our, that's our kind of instinctive thing. And it's, it's very difficult to say, why don't, you, why don't you go and do that? Try something different. It is, it is extremely difficult to, for, your, for your neocortex to tell the rest of your body to do things where you are clearly not hardwired to do things differently. And, and a lot of people just, I mean, t think about why, why do people not change, change jobs more often than, than they do. Look at other, look at the US. I mean, if you people move through the whole country for to to, to change jobs, mm -hmm. they really couldn't care less. Yes. And and we struggle with somebody from Birmingham or whatever who has to go and work in London and go, oh, oh, oh that's a big commute. Well, hold on, why don't you move? <laughs> Just the, really these things. We like our house, we like our garden, we like the, the concept that you pack stuff up and move. I came to the UK. I, I had I had a van with my stuff, my bicycle, my 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 vinyl collection, my 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 hi-fi, my clothes, uh, and 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 moved in. And they, and I kind of like, oh, what happened? What did I leave behind? Yeah, a nice car, and all, but you know what? It's fine. Absolutely. Get on with it. You know, in your in your camper van, Pierre, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now, of course. Any company needs to have a strategy, um, as you've been saying, you know, but, uh, you know, having a strategy and then executing it is a very yeah. different thing together. So 
what uh, what advice or, or any thoughts that you've got for our listeners on that gap between the strategy and the execution piece? That's a good point. You know, I, I, I'm very, I, I'm, I'm in a lot of things. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to be disruptive and innovative, but in, in strategy, I'm extremely old school. Mm-hmm. Strategy starts with issues, market situation, objectives, strategies, tactics. That's that's the thing that you have to go through. Mm-hmm. So often, I've sat in meetings where people were presenting tactics. And they called them strategies. And they go, okay, so wh- why are you actually doing that? Well, because it was, we thought it was a good idea. But why did we thought it was a good idea? Is it actually addressing an issue in the market by doing that? Well, we think so. Well, go, go back. Uh, uh, how, uh, I've ripped up so many slides with tactics where there actually was no strategy or strategies where there was no objectives. Uh, objective and objectives where there were no issues. So go back and go back and forth. And that's where things go wrong because people write down tactics before they really did all the other stuff. And then execution becomes disconnected from the the plan because actually the strategy probably was already disconnected from from the original. So why, why do strategy and execution so often go wrong? Because probably the strategy lacked connection to the issues and the objectives and the, ex- the execution and the tactics completely lacked them because we missed that step in between. So, and, and I've seen it, I've seen, you know, you, you do, you got, you got McKinsey or whatever come in and you do a revamp of your strategy. I get this expensive report with a lot of recommendations and, and then you suddenly need to start executing and implementing on it. But the implementation of these things takes guts, takes difficult decisions sometimes. You may need to do a restructure, people need to move into different places, and the, the, the kind of, um, what's the word, cautiousness or, or reluctance, again, to change in doing that, then makes the execution very weak versus what the actual recommendation was the other thing that i think there was a there was a uh, um one of one of your con colleagues recruitment agency did a survey recently in, with um board members about what they felt would help the company prosper on a board level yeah. and and almost 50 or 60 percent of the board members actually said that they felt that they should have a review of the strategy okay, and that, that they felt that they, did, that they didn't, um, they, they, they basically said about their colleagues that 50% of their colleagues had no clue about what strategy actually was. Right. And that's a, that's a, I mean, that's a harsh thing to say for some for <laughs> boards. So, but, but, but what happens, isn't it? So you're, you're a very good sales rep, then you become a first-time manager because you were good. Then you're a very good sales first-time manager, you become second-time manager. And 10, 15 years down the road, you're a business unit director or board member. But did you actually ever learn yeah. what it means? If you, I remember we had a session in, in, in MSD where we reflected on that. And we looked at companies like Shell or whatever. I mean, big old companies are a good example. Mm-hmm. They bring people in and they, they move them through the whole organization, sent them on, a, on, a, on an MBA, let them taste. I mean, McDonald's do the same thing, isn't it? You move through, through lots of parts before you move up. And you don't, you don't necessarily have to be good at one thing to move up because your skill set may be a different one than, than that you actually had than the other one. But in, 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 in my industry, in pharmaceutical industry, in pharmaceutical industry, that generally didn't happen. You were a good rep and then you became a good first line manager. And then you wanted to go in marketing. I mean, I did the same thing. I happened to be a good rep. I happened to be a good first line manager and then said to my boss, I want to do marketing. And he said, why? I said, well, I'm got a bit fed up with this sales stuff now. I think marketing would be good fun. And we had, we had an antibiotic. He said, fine, go and do this. If it works, you're fine. If not, we're going to sell it. Because I think Yamanuchi wanted to buy it from us at that point in time anyway. And you lose your job. 
no, fine. <laughs> but, and it, and it, it happened to work. But so I, I look at myself and I think, am, am I, what am I? Am I good at marketing? Am I good at selling? Am I good at strategy? And, and, and I, I, I probably think on, when you reflect on it, I'm probably a very, very good salesperson who happens to understand a few things around strategy. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people think that they're good at strategy because they were successful. And that's not necessarily the same. Mm -hmm. Because your target is is a result of a negotiation. Your target is not necessarily a result of a ambitious, where do we want to go? So there's a lot, just as much as there are many people teaching who should never have become teachers, there are a lot of people in, in senior management roles who have to do strategy, but they're just not very good at it. Yeah. And then automatically execution fails. Now, I remember we did this um, Great Places to Work. You, you'll know it. They do these surveys about why companies are successful. And one of, the, one, of, one of the gaps is companies that are successful have a very small gap between first-line management and senior management and between the front line and first line management. Mm. It basically means senior management has been able to explain or, or talk to first line management what the strategy, what the plan is, and first line management executes on the plan because they get it. The companies where there's a gap, the gap is not between first line management and the, and the, and the front line, the gap is between first line management and senior management. So what happens is senior management sits in the ivory tower, goes, ta-da, this is the plan. They never really involve anybody in it, throw it over the fence to first-time management, who will then do what? Execute on what they thought themselves is the right thing you do. And that's your gap between strategy and execution. And that, you need to be conscious of that. And the the way to close that is to to get your first-time management closer when I was in MSD, we, we did sessions every month where I brought all first and second line managers in and we discussed properly issues, objectives, strategy, input, and they got it. Exactly. And then you go out and that, and that works. Yeah, because you're completely involving them and they know what's going on in your head and, and yeah. what the plan is for the business. Yeah. So. And they can challenge it. They can disagree with it. You can have a discussion about it because... Yeah, I mean, sometimes you just get it wrong, isn't it? Yes, absolutely. And I think you're, you're totally right there. So many organisations just you know, don't get the, the, the management team or what they feel is the relevant management team really involved in, in some of the discussions or if the plans change. And, and you've mentioned this on my next question, you know, given the current climate with the pandemic, and you have touched on this, should startup companies now revise their strategy to look at having to adapt what we're now calling the new normal or even review their strategy on a regular basis which i think is something that you just mentioned yeah yeah i I think i think one of the one of the things that i've been struggling with is how do you because i I like me there's 15 of us in the company Mm -hmm. and we're all in the big office and and there's no proper hierarchy or whatever so we we throw things at each other shout at each other walk over and start discussions the middle of the room and everybody everybody joins in and then suddenly you find yourself instead of a whiteboard and do this whole mm-hmm. but but everybody does it yeah and I, and I struggle with this now and we enjoy it but but if you're all working from home these kind of impromptu there's a problem how we're going to deal with it yeah. there is an issue how we're going to deal with it throw some ideas actually I, I know zoom has a whiteboard functionality or stuff like that. But I've been doing Zoom meetings, Zoom meetings now for the last six months and haven't used it. And I wouldn't know how to do it. So I think that being conscious of that, of finding ways to deal with that, finding ways to, you cannot just work from home. People enjoy banter, people enjoy uh, uh, gossiping, People enjoy having a coffee together. People enjoy going for lunch together. And yes, you may have to do, uh, I don't know what, screens or one direction things going through the office and stuff. But all these companies that are now saying, oh, we're going to do working from home for life. 
that, that sounds very popular, but I don't think that's necessarily the solution to it. The new normal has to be a, has to be a combination of these things. We're, we're social beings. And, and, and I got seriously bored looking out of my kitchen window uh, and, and not being able to do something else. Uh, so yeah, yeah. Do I then actually call up one of my colleagues and have Netta with? No, I don't. But I should probably. So finding HR will have a really important role in that, and, and leadership will have a really important role in that. How are you going to do that? How are you? Because with with working from home comes increased flexibility. Also comes kids running around or. Um, uh, uh, whatever that you that you have to deal with uh, and and people oh i can't join this meeting it, it, it just it, it is not as easy as it is to keep everybody on board and for for many I don't know, single people where work yeah. is also part of their social life okay well, we've we've been doing a couple of things now we just say you know well, guys we're going to go to the pub and, and everybody from all over London just ended up in the pub once we could do that again. And we just spent a few hours there. And you, you just see people, people like sponges, just having that social time yeah. with their colleagues again. That, that's something I think we need to be very cautious about. So strategy, yes. But, but yeah, how do you operationalize your, your, your day-to-day practice? And, and reviewing strategies. Yeah, I mean, if you're... It's fundamentally different if you if between if you make something or if you're in a service industry. Mm-hmm. If you're if you're if you're making things, whether it's cars or TVs or anything else, all of that will just go back to normal yes. very quickly. Mm-hmm. And and I mean, you see it already now, isn't it? Come off all the all the manufacturing industry is all ramping up. Mm-hmm. And, and that's why that's why you see the German economy going through a lot slower bump. Than, than we are, because the UK is basically a service country, isn't it? So there is a service industry will suffer a lot more from that, whether it's hospitality or financing, everything else. And I guess those industries will need to look at what what new will look like and what you can do yeah. to, 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 to get your services closer to, I mean, for us, we, I think we were one of the, we were already thinking about these things anyway, but uh, uh, kind of in this five-year looking ahead stuff. Mm-hmm. So what, why do patients need to go to doctors to do consultations? So we were already thinking about online consultations. We, we already had a home delivery service for our products. So within five minutes, we switched on online consultations, doctors sent prescriptions to our pharmacy online, pharmacy contacts patients, delivers at home, boom, done within 24 hours. And that's, I think we, we actually doubled our sales from March into April, from April into May, and from May into June. Wow. Just, just because having that, that integrated, people loved it. Because you're, you're talking about patients, and patients by definitions, therefore, in these times are vulnerable mm-hmm. and need to need to shield and need to need to stay at home. Mm-hmm. So to have that service in place that that immediately was so again it's this and it's 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 something that we were planning on doing anyway, but we just were able to put it in, in place oh. very quickly. So yeah. So yeah. maybe maybe the change for strategy is uh, it forces us again to look further ahead and and crash because this is not the last pandemic yeah. this is not the last this is not the last horrible scenario that's going to happen so yeah look ahead and and ask these ask these weird questions like what would happen if there wouldn't be any sales reps at all yeah. what would happen if if tomorrow for some reason all pharmacies go i know it's not going to happen but uh, yeah how do you deal with that so that that prepares you and that's it's one of those things that I've always tried to do with, with my team. If there is an issue, you come up with a plan and I will, even without reading it, and it's a bit harsh, reject your first plan. Okay. Because I just want you to go back and have an all thing. 
Because <laughs> if, if, you, if you come back to me within five minutes, I have a plan. Well, that was fairly easy then, isn't it? That can't be that, can't be that simple. And now you go back. Public domain. Anyone that's working for you is going to do a very quick five-minute plan for the first one because they know you're just going to check it yeah, out. They knew. They knew. But they, you know, I, I talk to them about it. I said, "So you go back because I do it in my head. I do it in my head. I have a plan. I have a. There is an issue. I come up with a solution. I go. That was too easy. It can't be that simple. So go back. Is there an alternative? Go back. Is there another alternative? Yeah. And once you once it becomes once it becomes really hard to come up with another plan, what you've actually done is you've looked at it from every potential possible side, you eliminated the things that are irrelevant, you looked at the thing and, you, and you've nailed the one thing that's actually going to make a difference. Because we, we all know that 60, 70% of what we do doesn't make a difference anyway. Mm -hmm. So forget about that and focus on the 30% that make a difference. But you only do that, those 30% are the difficult 30%. So you only, you only get to that if you went through that, once you've gone through that elimination process of the 50, 60, 70 easy percent. So your, your fifth iteration of the plan is probably the one thing that we're going to do. Yes. And you're right. You know, you've got to think about absolute worst case scenarios. And I think it's a good process and I mean, it, not to do just in business, in life as well. I think you know, yep. you're so caught up, especially in this situation at the moment, you know, it is unprecedented times and people are losing their jobs and so many different things that are, that are happening globally. And, and I think you can adapt that methodology, as you say, even to your personal life of think about worst case, what's the worst that can happen and prepare, you know, and think, okay, well, I could lose my car or I could lose my house or whatever, but then yeah. work, you, you can work around that. You can find a solution. It's not as bad as, as we all think it might be without... No. You know, no, you're absolutely right. And, and, it, and it goes back a little bit what we were talking about earlier about this resistance to change, isn't it? We're, we're hardwired to, to be comfortable or to do things that make us feel comfortable. We are, we're not necessarily, I mean, you're, oh yeah, I like, I like change or I like uncertainty, whatever. No, you probably don't. You're, 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 you, you happen to be quite okay with it, but it, it, I mean, nobody likes sending on a burning platform. You can't, that, that, that just doesn't work. But if you, if you constantly ask yourself, what would happen if I wouldn't do it? And you're right, in your personal life. I mean, the, the asking somebody out or asking somebody not out, not asking, you're probably going to regret for the rest of your life. What's the worst that can happen, right? Exactly. No. Somebody's no. going to say no. So what? You're going to say, why not? <laughs> Isn't it? It's the fifth shining on that one, but you know that's another story. Yeah. Okay, that's a whole, that's a whole different that's a whole different <laughs> session. But it, it, it is the same thing. What's the worst thing we 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 talk about people? You know, we we talk about being risk averse or something like yeah. that. So what's the risk? The risk is it's not going to work. Well, how bad is that? Yes. You 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 you're, you're here. You're selling ten. You want to sell 20, you tie something to do that. It's not going to work. You end up selling 11. Well, that's still one more than you did before. Exactly. exactly. So what, what's the risk? The risk is it doesn't, that's the only risk that is there. Unless you do something criminal or God knows what. But the, the, there is, there is <laughs> when we talk about risk averseness as if, as if the world is going to crumble if we fail. Yeah, we and it's not. It's not. Just tie things. You know what? Screw stuff up. Pick yourself up. Exactly. learn from it and go get on with it absolutely yeah so look, i mean we've, we've, just, we've spoke about talent and of course you know these podcasts are not about promoting our business at all in any shape or form but i think any startup organization you know they they need to bring talent on board um and, and i guess for any company you know not only startups but having the right talent is is absolutely crucial but what would you advise to a founder of a startup regarding talent and hiring for their team yeah, yeah, you know, I think there are probably three things that, that we very easily forget. Things like job descriptions. Mm -hmm. You're in a startup, uh, you think you need, a, you, you need an auto market, you need a marketeer, or you need a whatever person. And then the recruitment agency goes, what's the job description? I haven't really thought about that. So we kind of throw something together. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's, 
it's that. Make sure that you really understand what you want a person to do. Then um, make sure that you actually give them objectives. And, and it, because it's, again, it's one of these easy things that you forget because we're all doing things and we're running around. But people want to know whether they're doing well or whether they're not doing well. And you want to, you want to get feedback. But that's the, that's the, and feedback is the other thing. We, that's the first thing that we forget. We, we forget giving people feedback. Oh, yeah, that was really good. Yeah, well, okay, but what was good about it? Yeah. Or, oh, you messed that one up. But what, what, what did I actually do wrong? So make, make sure that you actually know what you need. Get that job description sorted. Then, then set objectives for people. And they don't necessarily have to be targets. There's, there's a difference between objectives and targets. It can be developing skills and all of that stuff. It doesn't necessarily have to be I sell those 20 boxes because if you sell eight, and you're in a startup and that's what the resistance is, isn't it? Yeah. So my boss said to me, how many patients are we going to have at the end of the year? And I said to him, I was going to say, how many do you want? And he was like, well, <laughs> I, I want that, but we know that's not going to happen. But if, if we get half, do we consider that to be a success or do we consider that to be a failure? Going from, from zero to 500, where other countries took three years to get from zero to 500, did we do well or we were just lucky or something like that? So, it's not, so what, do we, what do we then do is we kind of forget about talking about the targets because they're difficult to manage. And that's not handy because the target is good. It's just yeah. people need to know where they so object, object, so job description, objectives and targets and feedback. Those are the things because we forget. Those are the things I would say so, to a startup. Think no, about it. And feedback is not always about people needing to have their ego stroked or being told that they're doing a great job. You know, it's, it's more about mm. understanding, like you say, are you achieving what the business is expecting of you? And, and also your personal growth and your own development and, and things like that. So I think, you know, you've, you've raised three really critical points there, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so I guess to top tips to summarize, you know, it's, it's a great subject and we've spoke for quite a lot today, but um, to summarize on this subject before we wrap up, Pierre, what would your top tips be to our listeners around this topic? I think there's, there's there are a few maybe. Um, trust, trust, trust your feelings, trust your people. Um, I mean, don't do everything on gut feeling, but you generally, know, you generally know what is right or what is wrong. People generally know when things are going bad. We just, we just need to, we just struggle with accepting that they're not going that we want them to do. And then we, it's this thing about, what's this saying? Um, kind doctors kind doctors create stinking or, or, or not healing wounds or something like that. If you need to cut something out, cut it out. Uh -huh. yeah, I mean, I'm, I was trying to do a Dutch translation, the translation of a Dutch saying that didn't really work. But if you, if, don't be afraid to make decisions. Don't be afraid to, to uh, do difficult things. You're, you're, you're better off doing the different. Look at, look at teams where we all know there is one person in that team who is messing it up for everybody else. What happens? All the others look at the manager. Uh, what are you going to do with it? Manager goes, no, I don't really like the confrontation. And maybe I wouldn't do it, blah, blah. But the longer you let it linger on, the worse it gets. Uh, you, lose, you lose the other members of the team because they go, why would I go? Because he gets away with it. So... What I would, why, what I would, why would I do these things? So, so yeah, make those decisions. Don't, don't. That's probably the most important things. Don't think. Don't be afraid to make decisions. Trust your gut because you probably know. Make sure that you that you look at your strategy and your plan. Reflect on that. And again, don't be afraid to. Or maybe I should rephrase that. Don't. Um, so achieving your target does not is not the same as being successful because you need to you, you could have been lucky 
uh, you have a lucky break. Uh, and we all know that targets are generally the result of a negotiation. Mm-hmm. And they go, there's some sandbagging going on and everything else. So, yay, we grew 10%. Well, you could have grown 20%. And I remember saying that to my team in Wyeth when I came into the UK. They were, they were growing X percent. And, and um, I, I came in and we were selling, what were we selling, like 80 million or something. Like that. So I said to them, how much, so this is 2007. I said to them, how, do, how much do we plan to sell in 2010? And they went, they looked at me and said, well, we have to look that up because it's somewhere in the decks, but we haven't really looked that out. Okay, so they came back as a 175. I said, okay, what would it take to take that to 200? Just because I like 200 in 2010 as a slogan, whatever. And they looked at me and said, well, pff, what, X, Y, and Z, uh, and more money, and I think, okay, so in those four years to that 2010, the aggregated additional sales is probably going to be 50 million. If I could go to, to whoever and say, I need a million extra investment, but I'm going to give you 50, are they going to say no to that? No, probably not. So we got the million. And when I left just after Pfizer bought, we landed at 196. Was that brilliant marketing? No. It was just thinking, what do I need? If that's what I want to get to, what do I need to do instead of doing this one, two year, three years thing? Strategies don't change every year. Tactics change. You don't have to write a new strategic plan every year. Write a new tactical plan unless something else completely changes. Then you can do a new strategic plan. But look at your tactics. So those would be my four or five things, I guess. Okay. And, and enjoy, enjoy. I think that's the Have fun whilst doing it. Yeah, we all forget that, don't we? And I think, you know, especially in these times, but, but you know, it's, it's just about making the most of, of what we can do and trying to achieve what we can. And, and, you know, and if it doesn't happen year one, year two, year three, we'll just keep at it. I think it's, it's the most uh, yep. the most prudent thing to say on that. But uh, we do need to wrap up here. Yeah, even That's though- That's a shame. I was enjoying it. <laughs> it. All day. Um, you're really, really interesting guest to have on. And I really oh, like- thank you. Yeah, once again for joining me today and, and sharing your thoughts with me and the audience. I'm sure that everybody's going to find it definitely invaluable. Um, and of course, if anyone did want to reach out to you for um, anything at all, I'm sure that you'll be happy to do so. And, and please I'd love to. So we'll put your branding on this podcast as well, here yeah, so that people do know. Okay. How- to you and I'm sure that obviously you'll only be too happy to speak to, to anybody. Yes. Perfect. And Thank so, you for having me, Claire. I really enjoyed it. Oh, very welcome, Pierre. Anytime, definitely so. And um, and so that is it for today's podcast. Join me again for the next episode in the series where I will have another guest on to talk about more relevant topics. Um, we hope that you found this beneficial, helpful and insightful and look forward to seeing you next time. So thanks again, Pierre. And, uh, thanks, Claire. Bye for now. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye.